right, so today I'm going to be talking about the for await of loop. Now this is a fairly new addition to JavaScript that lets us loop through asynchronous results. Now every other kind of loop that you have in JavaScript is going to want to run as fast as it can through all of the results. So if you've got an array or you've got a string, you've got an object, and you want to get through all of the properties as quickly as possible, you can use a for in, a for of, a for loop, a while loop, all these different kinds of loops. They want to go as quickly as possible. With the for await of loop, what we can do is have an object or an array that is a collection of things that are allowed to be asynchronous. So a fetch call or a promise or a timer. And these things, we don't know necessarily how long they're going to take. That's what makes them asynchronous. Now, if you don't know what asynchronous is, I have a video on synchronous versus asynchronous. I'll put the link down in the description. There's also a video on iterable versus enumerable and a video on the standard for of loop. All three links down in the description. So you can go watch those and come back if you want to understand a little bit more about what the asynchronous thing is and what iterators are. If you're comfortable with all those topics, then please continue on. So we have asynchronous things. All of these things that take an unknown amount of time. And we're going to be looping through those. One example would be if you're making a fetch call to fetch part of a data set. Let's say we've got a billion records to get through. We're not going to want to fetch the whole billion records, load all billion records into memory, and then loop through them. We want to do it in chunks. So this is going to allow us to do things like that. We can make fetch calls and get a hundred records or a thousand records at a time and slowly work our way through that. Await lets us deal with an object which has asynchronous content and then this property right here, this variable, is going to represent the value of each one of those. Now this could be anything at all. It could be a string, a number, a boolean, an object, an array. We don't know what it's going to be necessarily, or there's no requirement for it to be any specific thing. As long as we know what it is, we can work with it inside the loop. So here I have an array that I've put promises in. Each one of these promises has a set timeout. Now this array is going to be built as soon as the script runs. We've got a one second delay, a two second delay, and a three second delay. There will be a one second gap between them. So this one takes a second to come back, a second later this one, and then a second later this one will come back. We're going to have all three of these promises sitting in this array for us to loop through. Now if I was just using a standard for in or for of loop, this would fail because I'm going to go through the whole array before any of these have resolved. With for await of, I can wait. So this is going to run. The first one inside of here will be this. So we're going to get one coming back as the result. And then a second later, the second one's going to resolve and come back. A second later, the third one is going to come back. So let's run this and see what we get here. So we'll clear this out and run our code. After a second, we get the one, then the two, then the three. So all three results worked. This was a collection of asynchronous things. And in whatever, whatever order they're coming back, this first one resolves. It's going to be ready there. If this one took less time, then it was just going to be sitting there waiting. So if this one was four seconds, and these two were only taking one second, these are going to be sitting there waiting to be used. So we're going to wait for this one, and then the others will come back right away. So one, two, three, four seconds go by, and then one, two, three. So these two were ready and waiting, but there was a delay for this one. So it doesn't matter that which values we place inside of here. If this for await of loop needs to wait for something for the next item in the array to be resolved, it will wait. Now, if you understand iterators versus um, enumerable, you understand that with an iterator, we can add an iterator into an object. Objects by default don't have a specific order in which you can go through all the items inside the object, all the properties. So we can add one. 
we can add an iterator to an object. Now for it to work with for await, what we have to do is create an asynchronous iterator. And that's what this other file is. Now both these code files, they're inside of a code gist. The link is downside, down inside the description as well. So if you want a copy of these, you'll have it. Here's my object. I've got an object and I want to loop through it. So I'm going to use for await of my object because I'm going to have some asynchronous things happening inside of this object. The results are going to take some time to come back. So I have to wait for each result. Now inside of here, we have the async iterator, which is a property on the symbol object. This is now a property inside of my object. So I've created an object. It has a method called symbol.async iterator. This makes it a unique async iterator. And this method, when it's called, will run and it will return an object to us. This object must contain a method called next. That's how the for of and the for await of loops work. They look inside this object for an iterator or an async iterator with a method called next. Each time it loops, what it's doing is it's calling this next method. The next method, we write the logic ourselves to say how we're supposed to step through this. We can put anything we want inside of this returned object. In this case, we've got a counter property. So I'm using i as my counter, zero is the starting value. Then my next method. Inside the next method, I'm checking to see if my counter is less than three, then I'm gonna return a promise. Now here, unlike the previous page where we had the times 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 milliseconds, here I'm setting it to 1,000 for all three times that I'm going to return something. The reason I can do that is here, this set timeout does not occur until the next method is called. So down here, this is the same code we had on the previous page. So let's run this one. We're going to get the numbers coming back from the next method. Zero, one, two. So those are the values. Obj is going to have a value of this dot i. So that's our counter variable, zero, one, two. Those are going to be the values. The first one time it runs, it's going to pass back zero. The second time it's going to pass back one. The third time it's going to pass back two. Now we could break this up into multiple lines if it makes more sense for you. Feel free to do this. So this dot i is going to be equal to this dot i plus one. We do that after we set the value inside of this object. This object is what comes back. Inside the next method, we're always returning an object. We want to have a value property if possible and there needs to be a done property. This is either going to be true or false. False means there's another record or at least one more record, so we can call next again. If done equals true, if that's what comes back from the next method, then our loop knows we're through the entire thing. We've finished passing back all the values and we don't have to call it again, so our loop can exit because it's finished. It's run everything. So once again, if we run this, we can see that there is one second delay between each of the times that this gets called. Because every time we call next, we're calling this set timeout and we're waiting one second before we return this object. And as soon as i is three or higher, this is the, going to be the return value. It's a promise that's immediately resolving. We could have a delay here as well. If we rewrote the function like we did up here, new promise resolve. So we'll have after one second, after two seconds, after three seconds, and then three seconds later, it'll finish running. Let's clear it and run it one more time. So there's the one second gap between, and then three seconds later, that's when this is going to finish running entirely. All right, so I hope that makes sense. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave those in the comments down below. Like I said before, 
The links to those three other videos are in the description, as well as the code gist that has these two files. And as always, thanks for watching.